good bird dogging session last night with Mitt Romney who revealed that all this small business mantra is a bit of BS as he didn't know that 23 million Americans pay a 15.3 self-employment tax and he'll have to look into that because that does sound like a form of double taxation. Um, I really want him to represent uh, small business. He knows what he's talking about. So now we're going to Rick Santorum and see what he has to know about small business. And Rick might know something because he does come from a working class family and um, steel mills and unions and uh, I bet there's a whole bunch of small proprietors he knows about. So let's see what Rick has to say about the self-employed. And isn't it a lovely day on the other side of Lake Winnipesaukee? Hey, uh Thank you everybody's attention. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for um, for being out here. It is uh, it's great to be here in Northfield. Would you mind repeating the questions so we know what they are? Well, it depends what they are, because <laughs> I may want to answer a different question. <laughs> yes. um, I'm a farmer, and I live in rural America. All that's left in rural America, in terms of work, for the most part, is the self-employed. And I hear this small business mantra all the time about small business, but I don't hear the word self-employed. And there are 23 million self-employed Americans. I know you're from Pittsburgh, and you probably grew up with sole proprietors. And uh, not just coal miners, but sole proprietors. There's little stores at the corner. I'm sure you went to them. And all that's left in rural America now is are the, are the self-employed. And we're being killed by the self-employment tax. Uh, self-employment tax of 15.3% flat on all our income. And certainly regulations are a big problem too because most regulations are made for big businesses and small businesses, just the burden of the paperwork is a catastrophe. But I just want to address the self-employment tax because it didn't used to be 15.3%. It started at one and a half percent and then it evolved to become the employee and the employer's share, which in my mind is a double taxation and so if you're a family of four making $35,000, which I'll have to tell you in rural America is not bad, your first tax as a self-employed person is $5,000. Now what do you think drives the black market economy? People want to be honest, but you choose between $5,000, health insurance, food on the table, this is the burden on rural America and all self-employed people. But there are 110,000 of us in New Hampshire, and there's 23 million of us in this nation, and I really, really, really wish you would stop just saying small business and start saying small business and the self-employed, because we are the heart of working America. We are three-fourths of our business. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, and uh, I sort of lump, obviously, the self-employed by definition of small businesses, in my opinion, but uh, and they, they do and, and are important and are growing because of access to markets that, that the uh, internet allows. You have a lot more people who are working out of their homes and, and doing things and, and being successful. And, and taxes are clearly an issue, and I'll, let me address that. Regulations are clearly an issue that, that make it more costly for for those self-employed to be able to survive. When I was in the uh, in the Congress, one of the, the the only rating that I really cared about, I mean really cared about from the standpoint of economics, was from the National Federation of Independent Business. They were the folks who were focused on the sole proprietor, the small businessman, and making sure that they had a level playing field, that we weren't tipping, that they were concerned, unlike other businesses who would lobby, they would lobby for their own interests. <coughs> what NFIB lobbies for is for a marketplace that's fair. That's for a marketplace that doesn't crush the little guy by trying to target the big guy. And, and we've seen this, for example, in the Dodd-Frank bill. We've got all these little banks here in New Hampshire and across this country who are now being regulated like their city bank. Why? Because of Dodd-Frank. And it was supposed to be two separate systems, but they gave regulators the options to do the things that they were doing to big banks to little banks and so how many regulators are going around saying well I'm going to treat one bank this way and then forget about all the things that I'm doing with this bank and not do anything with these little banks well that just hasn't happened it's just easier for bureaucrats to treat everybody the same and they are and they're killing small banks they're killing small businesses so I, I would I would suggest that the regulatory environment is one thing the best way to do that is 
to, uh, and I propose this, is to look at all the, <coughs> excuse me, expensive regulations that have been put on to businesses, not just by this administration, but past ones. They, on average, over the last two administrations, we've seen about 60 regulations put forward per year by the Bush administration and the Clinton administration that cost businesses over $100 million a year. Most of these are well in excess of $100 million. This past year under President Obama, I love, President's got this commission that is supposed to, I think Cass Sunstein oversees, it's supposed to, you know, reduce regulation. Well, how many regulations do you think the Obama administration put forward that cost over $100 million last year? 60, 100, how about 150? This, this administration is crushing the business community. Why? Because they know better. They know how to better how to run your business. They're going to dictate to you how you should operate your business from, the, from a very detailed perspective from Washington, D.C. And, and, it's, and it's making businesses uncompetitive. It's requiring an enormous amount of paperwork and time away from productive things like making a profit. The second issue you got to is a, is a tougher issue because you're talking about the payroll tax. Well, what's the payroll tax there to do? Social Security. Social Security and? Medicare. Medicare. So we have a payroll tax that funds Social Security and Medicare. And the reason we do is, well, that's a basic benefit that you, quote, pay for, not really, but, quote, pay for over the course of your employment, and then you receive a benefit for paying for that at, when you retire. Now, what he's talking about is, as a self-employed person, you pay both the employer share and the employee share because you're self-employed, you're employing yourself. So you pay it as a business and you pay it as, a, as an employee. Um, and that, that instead of being a 6.2% Social Security tax, and is it 1.45, uh, it's 2.9, 1.45. Uh, it's 15.3. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 12.4 plus 2.9. Uh, you, you put those two things, th and by the way, it's going up under Obamacare. That, that payroll tax is going to go up under Obamacare. It's, it's, a, it's a burden to small business. It's a burden to the self-employed. But what's the alternative to that? Right? What's the alternative is to reduce the payroll tax. I'm sure the, you'd like to say, I don't want to pay the, the, the employer side of that or whatever. So it used to be structured that way. That's the history of it. It used to be that way. And even at Reagan made it, it was one and a half times the employee and the 1986 Tax Reform Act raised it from 10% to 15.3%. So it's not just a quote, it evolved that way. It's 83. 83, thank you. Um, I love how good you are at remembering details. <laughs> that's, a real, that's a real point for you. Well, but, but really, the last, I'm, I'll let it go to the other questions, but Harry Truman was the only self-employed president I believe we've ever had. He put us in that system at one and a half percent. And it was only the employee's share because he understood what the evolution of employee and employers would be. So I would like to go back in time a little bit to some fairness. Yeah, I mean, the 83 uh, Social Security reform, I love Ronald Reagan. He got snookered in the 83 reform. Because uh, what happened in, in, in 83 was he got a bunch of tax increases that Tip O'Neill and Greenspan and the folks who put this was the Greenspan Commission. Uh, they, they, were, they, they got a bunch of tax increases immediately, what you were talking about, and the rate went way up. Uh, it went up to, Social Security went up to 12.4%. Uh, they did get some benefit cuts, but, and, and they did it in a very smart way. I mean, uh, the benefit cuts didn't come for a long, long time. Uh, in, in fact, I suspect I was at an event, town hall meeting in Brentwood the other day, and someone was complaining, I've been talking about Social Security, not complaining, but talking about Social Security, and I talked about you know some of the things we're going to have to do to change the Social Security system, and uh, and I asked you know what's the retire what's the eligibility age right now for Social Security? Anybody know? 67. Sixty. It's it's sixty six in, in a month or two, and it's going to go to sixty seven. When did that happen? In nineteen eighty three. And they didn't start changing it. It was sixty five back then, and they changed it in nineteen eighty three under Ronald Reagan, but it didn't take effect for twenty years. So none of you people are mad at Ronald Reagan for having done that. Because right? <laughs> none of you know. So we've just uh, 
We've just had our moment with Rick Santorum, and uh, I have to say he knew the the issue. I don't know if I'd like his answers, uh, his, his solutions, but I will give him credit. He totally understood the self-employment tax. He, he knew our problem. Uh, how, what he would do with it, he didn't give a word because I don't think he knows what to do with it.